My guest today is General James Cartwright, retired from active duty on September 1, 2011, after 40 years of service in the U.S. Marine Corps. General Cartwright served as Commander, U.S. Strategic Command, before being nominated and appointed as the eighth Vice Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, the nation's second highest military office. He became widely recognized for his technical acumen, his vision of future national security concepts, and his keen ability to integrate systems, organizations, and people in ways that encourage creativity and spark innovation. General Cartwright sits on a number of boards and is an advisor to a diverse range of organizations involved in national defense and global affairs. He holds the Harold Brown Chair in Defense Policy Studies for the Center for Strategic and International Studies and is a senior fellow at the Harvard Belfer Center. But maybe his most important strategic position is as a member of the Board of Governors of Wesley Theological Seminary. He we turn to him many times for his experience and wisdom on a wide variety of issues. And so I thank General Cartwright for joining me in this presidential conversation. So I have to ask you, I'll, I'll reveal my background. It's just my office here at Wesley. But uh, General, what's, what's behind you? What's your background there? Uh, these are two of the Falcon 9 rockets line, landing simultaneous uh, down at uh, Canaveral. And um, you know, one of the big advances in technology right now, Elon Musk and his driverless cars, but really the space side of this SpaceX. Um, and so these are two of them coming in, landing simultaneously. Huh. Well, um, thank you for the time here to have uh, a little less uh, dramatic uh, uh, topic. <laughs> and you've had the experience of briefing the president and major corporations and institutions on emerging threats, both military and otherwise. In the world of strategic planning, the phrase uh, black swan has emerged to describe those impossible events that nevertheless sometimes happen. Well, I looked it up, a group of sheep is a flock, cows are herds, and swans are a bevy. We seem to have a bevy of black swans in 2020. If you look ahead now, what's on your list? Uh, you know, uh, for sure that if you try to foretell the future and uh, and guess what it's going to be? You're going to be wrong. So I'll be wrong here. But um, I, I tend to follow, um, there's a document that comes out of the government, I think every three or four years, that is the long range um, assessment of the world and what are the major vectors and trends that you see. And they always start with those things that are considered existential. And here existential means existential. In other words, the end of the race, the end of, of humanity. And um, there, until about 10 years ago, there were two. Um, one was a pandemic, whether it was human uh, sponsored or natural occurring. And the other one was um, uh, the construct that uh, something uh, extraterrestrial, <laughs> um, think more in the term of rocks, uh, mm -hmm. uh, hit the earth. Um, and those were the two existential threats to humanity. Um, about 10 years ago, nuclear war was added into that. Um, and when it came out this last time, those three appeared and I, my look at that was um, different than what I had assessed it in the past. I still think the pandemic is something that we are going to have to worry about up until now, and I think uh, the breakthroughs that are occurring now, we as, as, you know, as humanity have been able to figure out solutions faster than it could become existential. You know, we warded it off. And I think that'll probably be the case for another 10 years, at least. Um, however, the nuclear and the 
you know, the rocks from space, um, all really revolve around something fundamentally different. The, the outcome of nuclear and the outcome of a massive meteor hitting the earth are really disruptions to the ecosystem. And, um, uh, you know, we're talking climate change and things like that. Well, this is climate change on steroids, uh, nuclear cold winters and, uh, and the same really with an asteroid. And so I think those two are coming together. And I think that we are living in a pretty fragile ecosystem right now. And so if I'm to worry about something that would um, truly be existential, it would probably be a disruption to the ecosystem, whether it was you know, nuclear war, whether it was an asteroid hitting the earth, whether it was just our own overconsumption and overpopulation of the planet and its ability to support life. Um, those are the places I would look. You didn't. You really like to start on a positive thought, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't specifically list global warming. Is that? Uh, it's not an existential threat so much as a dire threat, or? Well, global warming. If you if you set off three hundred nukes, um, it gets pretty warm pretty quick. Yeah. So it's really different. A it's really more a question of rate. Um, you know, uh, a nuclear war or a meteor tends to disrupt the climate instantaneously, yeah. where um, global warming is kind of the boiling of the frog. Um, both are, you know, tend to take you in the same direction. The good news with the frog is that there is a way to um, interject and, and uh, at least have some say in, in what happens. We may not we may not heat it, but we, we've got some say. Yeah. So that, as you say, that's, it's a difficult way to start an interview. <laughs> Especially in 2020, you know? Yeah. <laughs> right in the middle of a pandemic. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it, I don't know if, if uh, it's wise to ask this question, but uh, what gives you hope? We, we talked about our grandchildren before the program started. What gives you hope for the future of your of our grandchildren? Well, I mean, from my perspective, the, in the probability side of the equation, um, I think the human spirit, number one, and our ability to innovate faster than some of these threats emerge. In other words, we get a say in it. Um, a lot of that is on the positive side. The pandemic issue, um, you know, for a long time, we had um, protocols for perfection in medicine. And, um, I, you know, getting more to the, okay, what's good enough quick, quickest, and then how do we perfect it after we get there? This is kind of the, in engineering, it's called the March of the Nines. But it's this idea that the edge cases, um, you know, you will spend all of your money and all of your time if you try to solve the edge cases first. Um, you're better off going at the masses and, and then working your way out to the edge cases. And, I, you know, my sense is that um, uh, however you may look at it, the work that was done over the last 10 years in genomics and DNA and, uh, and chromosome work and, and RNA, has really advantaged us um, now in the speed at which we might address many of these problems uh, on the pandemic side. So I, I see positive there. Um, the other two, I think there are things that are going on that are probably helping us. Um, I probably worry most about the nuclear war scenario um, because we just don't know where the tipping points are. We don't, we don't know the coupling of, of um, of the downside activities that occur as a result of a nuclear uh, blast. Uh, and so um, we're kind of the blind man walking towards the cliff trying to feel where it is uh, in that. And that's where I probably worry the most. Well, and you've been um, fairly active in arguing for an eventual denuclearization of the planet. Um, are, is, is, do you have much hope that the clock can, the nuclear clock can go backwards a little bit on that? Uh, uh, the, the, the news from the world doesn't seem so. 
Well, um, uh, I guess my approach to, to that issue has been much like um, the Emancipation Proclamation. Um, if you set a goal, even if that goal is probably unattainable in any normal circumstances, um, you have a venue by which to judge your own actions, a moral venue. And so if an action is taking you closer to the goal, it's a positive action. If it's taking you further from the goal, then red flags ought to go up. Mm -hmm. And if you, if you don't look at a problem like war and try to think of it in those terms, then, um, then I think any solution is justified and you can rationalize it in your mind. And I don't want to be in that place. And so um, people said you, you know, couldn't get rid of chemical or, well, you can't, but we made a choice there and we find all, we found alternatives to solve the problems that we were using chemical uh, munitions for. So I think the same is true on the nuclear side. I think there are alternative venues by which we can exercise imposing will on another um, and still allow ourselves to uh, uh, move in a positive direction. So um, mm -hmm. do I think that nuclear weapons will ever go away? No, you don't uninvent things. Um, do I think that we have the ability to make choice in a positive direction? Yes. Hmm. Well, let me take you from the uh, global <laughs> to the parochial, from the, uh, maybe even from the secular to the sacred. As you know, we, we have yet to form a, a defense committee on the Board of Governors at Wesley. So uh, you serve on the investment committee, uh, but you've also been very involved in really every aspect of this institution. What about the work we do at the seminary to prepare leaders for church and other faith-based organizations? What is the role of, that they play? What is the role of the church in light of these really large challenges and uh, the need uh, uh, to make uh, choices based on values. Is it simply to provide comfort? Is that the role of the church and the pastor? Uh, Wesley was positioned in Washington to play a role in the public square. What should that be, especially now? Yeah, um, you know, my, my opinion here is that um, you know, in a construct of governance between nation states, you have kind of a policy level of activity and then you have the law level of activity. And in between are normally norms and regimes. So you kind of look at that and you say, okay, where does this fit? How does it fit? And I also go back again to the document that I was talking about earlier on uh, the national intelligence forecast as you look out to the future. And one of the things they identified was that in this period in which extreme pressures in their words were gonna be put on nation states and governance in order to feed, create water, create energy, create the ability to sustain life in cities, it was gonna get really tough um, you know, as we go forward into the future. And that one of the institutions globally that could reach beyond uh, normal nation state governance was the church. Um, and that the church would have create and establish and maintain a foundation of norms and regimes. They wouldn't be policy, they wouldn't be law, but they would be moral high ground, which would connect policy and law and would do so across nation states instead of just intra perspective. And so to me, where Wesley is located is ideal for having a hand in a, uh, on what's the policies that are being thought about now and necessary to sustain us. What are the laws that, that would then arise from those policies, you know, likely over time? And what are the norms and regimes that sit in between those that put the moral high ground in, in, in perspective? And I think that's where Wesley sits. That's why this geographic location is so important. Um, if religion is to play that role of the moral high ground in between policy and law, then I think, you know, I mean, there are people who are gonna argue with that, that, that framework, but I still think it's, it's relevant to where Wesley is physically and 
what Wesley can do and influence. Hmm. You mentioned the international scene and the way that we can uh, bridge uh, across national boundaries. Wesley has always tried to uh, enable other students from other nations to be a part of our community. We've established extraordinary uh, global connections. Uh, but the global pandemic um, has created challenges and really added to uh, inter international tensions with some of the countries that really require cooperation uh, that set up additional barriers to Wesley being the, the global seminary we aspire to. Um, we responded over the last few months really to create what we call a do global doorway for students from China and several African countries to do their degree work online. But that's, that's a stopgap measure. That doesn't, that's not the flat earth uh, uh, hmm. idea. It's not the way that uh, Wesley can become a, a truly global institution. What do you see in the long run for our international engagements? Um, okay, I, I, I'll tread on dangerous ground here. I, I disagree that the doorway can't be a fundamental leverage point in which we can move ahead. Um, I mean, I, let's go back to the 14th century. It was mountains that were in the way. And the printing press found a way around those mountains without physical connection. Um, it's just, it's, it's a similar place that we are today. And to open up a doorway that circumnavigates the mountains and the oceans and the pandemics to, to get to people um, and to provide something that is truly international um, among nation states, um, I think this is, this is a key part of that venue, uh, education, and, and, and then the proliferation of norms and regimes and the exposure to different cultures of those norms and regimes. Uh, those are all part and parcel to the printing press. I mean, it, it, the analogy I think is, is right on, on point. This is the kind of stuff we need to be doing. And the nice part about it is it's not, it's not, instant that you can go to scale, but going to scale is more than possible. That, that makes sense. I mean, my own uh, view of where we're going in the use of online technology is that it's, it's taking us back to the most classical image of education, which is Socrates under a tree surrounded by students. Right. Uh, he wasn't giving lectures um, mm -hmm. so that there's the, the, interaction between the teacher and the students and the students themselves um, that I, I think is pretty essential. I mean, to take your analogy, if you want to look for where the printing press was used, it was in monasteries mm -hmm. uh, for the most part, uh, yeah. like us. Um, so I, I see us moving in a direction where we realize what the global or what the um, online technology can do, and we figure out what is most essential about face-to-face -face and what is just as easily or better done um, through virtual technology. But the, maybe the other challenge of that is each of these students who are using the global doorway came because of relationships we developed in person in these countries over a long period of time. And I think a lot of us are finding during this period we're making use of existing relationships rather than starting new ones. That that's the effect of uh, isolation. Um, I agree with that for our generation. I don't <laughs> agree with that for the students. I think the students are, are, are you know, will, uh, you know, keep rolling and spreading in a way that our generation never would have. Yeah, and, um, uh, you know, and so we see it as the as the starting point, and I don't disagree with you as the starting point. But I think the ability to go to scale is not in our generation; it's going to be in the following generations. Yeah, yeah. This is the kind of advice you give me regularly, <laughs> and it usually starts with our generation. So you're, you're reminding me of that. Uh, in fact, that takes me to another question. That's that's. Uh, a kind of issue we've bandied about very helpfully over the years. And that is, how do you assess the importance of um, 
character and leadership. I mean by that, um, you know, Stephen Covey wrote some years ago about principle-centered leadership. And principles are certainly a part of what we mean by character, but we also uh, more classically mean the formation of certain uh, virtues. And I guess the question I want to ask you is somebody who um, has studied leadership and practiced leadership for a long time with especially uh, emphasis on the technological and technical capabilities is character important in leadership or is it really just a, a technical challenge, a calculation of means and ends? Uh, it, it, you know, I, you've already shown your bias in, in saying, or is it? <laughs> and, um, but, but I, you know, I tend to say that there is a foot in both camps here. Um, you know, the, the moral side of this and the, and the activities associated with character in leadership um, tend to go to the human side of the equation, okay? Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, for me in my background, um, uh, you know, the, the essence of this activity, not the, not the things that you see on, you know, banners on walls and in offices and stuff like that, you know, is one is a, a, a consistency. Um, uh, whatever it is that you do has a level of consistency to it, such that the people that are under your charge in some way or another, or the inf issues that you are trying to influence, at some point start to be able to finish your sentences, okay? Um, that way, particularly when you lead large enterprises, um, your staff is able to be more effective and have more leeway because they know where you will go and they know, you know, where that moral high ground is um, in, in your way of thinking. And what you've got to demonstrate is one, how do you, how do you interpret a moral high ground? Where is that? Where would I understand that? Is it just a feeling or is it just, is it just American or is it international? How do you look at that moral high ground? And, um, and then second, that they will never be wrong, <laughs> quite frankly, if they can show progress towards a moral high ground in, in whatever it is we do in action. If, if, if Hemingway and Old Man in the Sea, you know, where you walk by the boat and you see the skeleton on the side of the rowboat and you don't have to be a fisherman to know what a hero is. It's the same here. It, it, it is the ability to uh, have a, a constant moral compass that others can interpret and act inside of in a way that allows them to you know, both find fulfillment in their own actions, but also find fulfillment in the direction of the institution, the direction of the ideals the institution represents, et cetera. And so to me, you know, that's where the character piece is. Um, it, it is, it is, it is not something that is just, oh, you know, they'll follow him anywhere because he's a good guy, he smiles right, or he looks like me or whatever it is. It goes well beyond that. Um, and to play to that really is to play to um, a short-sighted leadership kind of construct. You have to have some sort of a moral high ground here that no matter who works for you, who, who operates under any kind of um, premise that you, know, that you would put forward, has in their mind what your moral high ground is, how you define it, not exactly what it is verbatim. There are a million solutions to every problem, but in a diverse approach to problems, they know how to grade their, their result. It's moving in the right direction. So in, in your life in your career you've seen the sort of the e extreme uh, case of how you demonstrate your moral high ground and, and that is sacrifice mm -hmm. um, and where you come and, and in a way um, the connection between that I felt and and what we teach here is that um, the Christian truth is that sacrifice is not just delayed gratification. 
it, it's something else. It, it's more than that. And that um, that's a way that the moral high, the, the trustworthiness to bring another word in is um, so critical. And that actually brings me to um, the last question that touches on our current political scene, but I'm not going to ask you to, to take sides on that. I'm going to try to stay right on the edge of, uh, of that issue. Uh, there are calls uh, for some of our nation's uh, other four-star generals to speak out on the president's statements vis-a-vis -vis, um, military service. On the other hand, there is a strong tradition in this country of civilian control of the military. So some have felt it is inappropriate for them to speak without necessarily talking about any of these individual cases. What's your view of the principle involved here? Uh, there, uh, one, there are two different venues here of sacrifice that we're kind of looking at. Um, if I am a, if I am Lance Corporal Cartwright, and somebody tells me to take the hill. Um, and I feel that in taking the hill, it may cost me my life, you know, and I'm going to make an ultimate sacrifice and be ready to stand up to that. That's, that's, that's one level of sacrifice that, you know, that we uh, approach. Another is to look at an issue like this and to say, okay, where do, where does this fit in? Um, where does the separation of military versus political power and how do you, how do you articulate that? And I guess for me, and this is just my personal feeling on this issue and, and certainly not one that I haven't thought a lot about, but if, if I am for this country um, in my training, um, uh, in my case for 40 years, um, responsible for generating the ideas, the plans, the, the policies, the strategies to impose will on others who don't want it imposed on them and to create mayhem. Um, and, I, and I'm really good at it. Um, I'm not sure those are the skills or biases you want to bring to political office. Um, I think they are skills that should be provided and offered and certainly are necessary in securing um, various wants and, and, and liberties. But um, I think the country ought to be very careful on over-reliance on, on um, those skills, um, both as skills and then those people that have those skills. Politicians historically have been um, very uncomfortable with generals. Um, national leaders are are almost too, and I and I there are no you know there are more than enough uh, instances where um, right or wrong uh, generals have moved into the political sphere, either in a coup uh, construct or in you know in just stepping into the political limelight. And I, to me, the, that set of skills is, is the wrong set of skills. Um, you know, the point of the political office is to avoid having to use those skills. And, um, and so I, I don't, you know, I don't hold against or I don't, you know, can, you know, um, show bias or angst about generals that become, you know, um, high-ranking civilian, civilians in government. But I think that the government as a general rule should be very careful about how much of that they allow to happen. Hmm. Hmm. So, yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I'm, you know, I've done this. I've, I've thought about this an awful lot. And, um, yes. you know, military advice is one thing, making it the rule. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, it just uh, it it for me it, it it's not compatible, and I you know I don't I feel like I have a moral high ground, and I'm very comfortable with that, but I still don't feel like I ought to be a politician, uh, even if I could. I mean, uh, I just don't think that's right. Well, I'd vote for you, 
And I'd, I'd have to say that uh, in your role as, as governor at Wesley, you, you've never exercised your capacity for mayhem. And I want to thank you for that. <laughs> we, we, we have um, enough yeah. people <laughs> wanting that. Uh, so I, I appreciate the, the advice you, you give us and, uh, and your time here today. Thanks very much. Yes, sir.